We're knights of the round table. We dance whenever able. We do routines and choreograph scenes with footwork impeccable. We're opera mad in Camelot. I have to push the pram a lot. That's right. You guys remember that scene in the Holy Grail? They're singing Knights of the Round Table. And then it quickly cuts to the guy down in the dungeon who can distantly hear the music. And he's hanging on the wall in chains and he's all, that's ah, a pretty good tune. Well, friends, Theon is that guy. That's right. This entire chapter, this entire Theon Winds of Winter chapter takes place with Theon chained to the wall <laughs> and watching everything that's going on and sort of clapping along in time to Stannis's routine. Uh, and Stannis's routine is the get all the traitors out routine, which is, which is that's a good one. <laughs> so this chapter does, of course, feature Stannis as well as Asha Greyjoy. And it's a heck of a chapter. It might be my favorite winds of winter chapter and in case you're just tuning into our winds of winter read-alongs spoiler alert this is the winds of winter spoilers uh we are essentially going through we're going to read the entire chapter as we're doing with all the winds of winter chapters but we're going to intersperse with uh commentary and discussion and uh but first you guys may notice i look a little different no it's it's not the hair it's not the beard that's all within the range of normalcy no, it's, it's this new camera that I got. That's right. I got a new camera looking a little, little more detail instead of just a black blob where my hair is. You can actually see all my wonderful textures. Yes, yes, yes. And she'll also show off this nice piece of artwork that one Elisa patient sent me. As you can see, it is a dragon comet on its way to the moon. Thank you, Elisa. And Elisa Patience, of course, has a terrific... Song of Ice and Fire YouTube channel, which is conveniently titled Alisa Patience, A L I S A Patience. And uh, Alisa has, of course, she uh, looks for the, the fairy tale correlations, uh, the classic European fairy tale and folklore correlations in a Song of Ice and Fire, of which there are plenty. So check her out. We are, she's, she's inching towards her first thousand subscribers. She's at 700 something. So let's let's try to boost her over there. Everyone that's watching, go check out Elisa Patience's YouTube channel. Give her a sub. And without further ado, let's tear into this Theon chapter. Like I said, this is really possibly my favorite chapter. It, it, it's just a really good example of sort of like George's writing, the things that we love about George's writing. Uh, so that's why I dig it. And real quick, guys, let me open up the extra chat window to help me keep track of all you guys' chats. You can support the program, of course, with the super chat function inside of YouTube that highlights your comment or question, so make sure that I see it. Um, you can also support the program at the link below, right here, mythical, paypal.me, mythical astronomy. That one goes straight into my account and I get 100% of the proceeds as opposed to YouTube taking a cut. So that's always preferable if you're feeling a little more generous, but either way is great. Send me money, friends. That's what this is all about. Well, it's, it's partly what this is about. I do have to pay bills and rent in order to keep doing this. But of course, what this is really about is symbolism, mythology, and personal transformation. Oh, yes. So I'm just going to pop out the chat here on the side. Thank you. All of my wonderful mods are all we're, our mod roster is well stocked. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, Theon. So one thing before we start the chapter, I just want to emphasize, uh, in case anybody has forgotten, Theon no longer looks like Theon. And let me just adjust monitor a tiny bit here. Tilt it down. There we go. Get my pendant in. All right, so um, Theon no longer looks like Theon. Theon is now decrepit. He is turning into the Grey King. He's all gray and white. His skin is gray. His hair is white. Obviously, he's missing fingers and that other thing. Uh, but <laughs> uh, the, the main point is that is that Theon doesn't look like... You have to remember, this is a very transformed person. When uh, Asha Greyjoy, Asha Greyjoy, as I try to remember to pronounce her name because of the ash tree symbolism, Asha Greyjoy, when she sees Theon in Stannis' war camp outside of Winterfell, she doesn't even recognize him at first. She looks at him with pity and like, ooh, this old man, blah, blah, blah. She's like, wait, it's Theon. He looks like an old man, like a sick old man. So he's really, um, 
He's undergone the reek makeover, as it were. And that's not just chopping things off like his entire. He's just, yeah, it's awful. What we don't. We don't want to talk about what happened in that dungeon. Unlike Dave and Dan, who big fans of torture porn. Um, Lauren Griffin says, I always get the Camelot song stuck in my head. It'll be forever tainted. In seeing Theon doing the clapping in the dungeon. Uh, yeah, yeah, well. You know, that's the thing about ADD brains and uh, symbolism and stuff. Is I just, you know, my brain is very good at looking at one thing and saying, this thing is like this other thing. <laughs> and sometimes you come up with, with strange results. All right, so like I said, Theon is looking transformed, and I'll pull up some a couple of pieces of artwork to sort of set the tone. The one that I used um, in the for the cover of this stream is called Theon Greyjoy, Prince of Winterfell by Logan G. Let me just share that with you guys. Pretty cool there. And this is available. You can buy this as an art print, by the way. So once again, this is Theon Greyjoy, Prince of Winterfell by Logan G. And uh, it's, it's definitely a touching piece. He's listening to Bran's voice. This is probably a Prince of Winterfell type scene. But of course, Theon and his Weirwood Tree connections are going to come up in uh, in this chapter as well. And then I've got another nice piece of artwork that is along the same lines, showing the transformed Theon. This one is called Apologize, and it's by Fralichen. And let me share that. Nice. Yeah, this is a good one. So you can see this is captures that desperate moment when he's sort of searching for his name in the godswood and he hears Bran whisper Theon on the wind. So, yeah, and it captures that sense of growing remorse that Theon has. Um, so, yeah, definitely kind of the ultimate redemption arc is Theon in Song of Ice and Fire. All right. So, I'm not going to show the young Theon artwork, of which there is many. I prefer Mike Hallstein's uh, Theon artwork. And, of course, Mike Hallstein just kills for a Song of Ice and Fire artwork, especially the Greyjoys, Damon Blackfire. He's awesome. But, in any case, oh, I guess now I have to show it since I mentioned it. We'll do, we'll do one young Theon just to capture the before and after, right? Uh, there we go. So this is Theon Greyjoy on Pike by Mike Hallstein. Mike Hallstein, one of my, again, one of the best Song of Ice and Fire artists, I have to say. So very cool. So that's young, cocky Theon dressed in his landlubber finery. He's got the squid brooch and he's at Pike there, but basically looking like a Stark. So, all right. All right. Let's, uh, that's very nice. Okay, so Theon Greyjoy, The Dance with Dragons, first Theon chapter. The king's voice was choked with anger. You are a worse pirate than Salador San. Theon Greyjoy opened his eyes. His shoulders were on fire, and he could not move his hands. For half a heartbeat, he feared he was back in his old cell under the Dreadfort, that, that the jumble of memories inside his head was no more than the residue of some fever dream. I was asleep, he realized. That or passed out from the pain. When he tried to move, he swung from side to side, his back scraping against the stone. He was hanging from a wall inside a tower, his wrists chained to a pair of rusted iron rings. So <clears throat> with this one, it's not necessarily the first sentence that jumps out to me as stating the theme of the chapter. The king's voice was choked with anger. You're a worse pirate than Salador son. <clears throat> really what we're talking about is it's this third chapter. Uh, third sentence, for half a heartbeat, he feared he was back in his old cell under the Dreadfort, that the jumble of memories inside his head was no more than the residue of some fever dream. So that really captures how broken Theon is and how fragmented his awareness is. His It's his very, 
identity of self that's been broken down by Ramsey Bolton, right? And that's why he's lost his name. And it was so meaningful for him to try to get his name back when, and Brand sort of gave it to him when it whispered his name and he started calling himself Theon. And then here, instead of Reek and all the other uh, chapter titles like Prince of Winterfell, we've actually got Theon's name back. So this, cha this chapter is actually titled Theon Greyjoy. And I'll drop the link, by the way, in case anybody wants to read along. It's also in the description. So the air reeked of burning peat. The floor was hard packed dirt. Oh, and before I go any further, also, obviously, so Theon's very uncomfortable. Like I said, he's chained to the wall. His shoulders are like dislocated. His hands, he can't move. He's it's basically being tortured, essentially. Not quite as bad as Ramsay, but, you know, I know, it doesn't sound like being chained to a wall is a lot of fun. So the air reeked of burning peat. The floor was hard packed dirt. Wooden steps spiraled up inside the walls to the roof. He saw no windows. The tower was dank, dark, and comfortless. Its only furnishings, a high-backed chair and scarred, and a scarred table resting on three trestles. No privy was in evidence, though Theon saw a chamber pot in one shadowed alcove. The only light came from the candles on the table. His feet dangled six feet off the floor. My brother's debts, the king was muttering. Joffrey's too, though the baseborn abomination was no kin to me. I guess I should have read that. My brother's debts. Joffrey's too, though the baseborn abomination was no kin to me. Theon twisted in his chains. He knew that voice. Stannis. Theon Greyjoy chortled. A stab of pain went up his arms, from his shoulders to his wrists. All he had done, he had... Sorry, hang on one second. All he had done, all he had suffered, Moat Kalen and Barrowton and Winterfell... Abel and his washerwomen, crow food and his umbers, the trek through the snows, all of it had only served to exchange one tormentor for another. Your grace, a second voice said softly, pardon, but your ink is frozen. The, Brav the Bravosi, Theon knew. What was his name? Tycho, Tycho something. Perhaps a bit of heat. I know a quicker way. Stannis drew his dagger. For an instant, Theon thought he meant to stab the banker. You will never get a drop of blood from that one, my lord, he might have told him. Oh, yeah, Theon's inner monologue in this chapter is actually really funny. He's kind of, uh, take care, you guys have a good Sunday. Theon is, Theon is a little bit, uh, he's a little bit mad, and he's kind of uh, past the point of caring. So his commentary is starting to get actually really funny, because Theon is smart. Uh, he's clever, or at least he was uh, when he was Theon. And now that he's been starting to find his personality again, he's starting to remember. Like, he understands political intrigue. He knows a lot about all the people in Winterfell, more than most people. You know, he knows the, the Starks and uh, the other Northmen from all his time growing up in the North. So, um, yeah, so... <laughs> He, this comment here, you'll never get a drop of blood from that one, my lord. So he's talking about the bloodless banker. So he's basically making a banker's or bloodless joke, even while he's hanging on the wall. I think that's cool. It's refreshing. You know, it's important not to lose your humor, even in dark times. It's funny the chat is all saying bye to Quinn. All right. Yeah, out here in Sacramento, it's a very sunny, sunny Sunday. Good day for going out and doing stuff. Or for having a live stream in the comfort of your own home. So Stannis draws a knife and uh, Theon makes his joke and it says, the king laid the blade of the knife against the ball of his left thumb and slashed. There, I will sign in my own blood. That ought to make your masters happy. If it pleases your grace, it will please the iron bank. Stannis dipped a quill in the blood welling from his thumb and scratched his name across the piece of parchment. You will depart today. Lord Bolton may be on us soon. I will not have you caught up in the fighting. That would be my preference as well. The bravos, he slipped the roll of parchment inside a wooden tube. I hope to have the honor of calling on your grace again when you are seated on the Iron Throne. When you are seated on your Iron Throne, rather. You hope to have your gold, you mean. Save your pleasantries. It is coin I need from bravos, not empty courtesy. Tell the guard outside I have need of Justin Massey. <laughs> yeah, Stannis... Uh, the opposite of Theon, Stannis uh, does, 
is not keeping his sense of humor through the dark times. Uh, Stannis does have the dry wit, but uh, he does not have any of the charm, any of the sort of spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. He's like, I'm here to give you medicine. Open your mouth. <laughs> that's, that's basically... Uh, uh, and once again, I have worded things in a sexually suggestive manner without meaning to. Well, that is what we come for after all. <laughs> Don't <laughs> do it again. Ah, okay. All right. Out of the gutter. Adam Phillips with a PayPal. Thank you, Adam. Just, just a thank you. All right, cool. So getting back on track here without any innuendo at all. It would be my pleasure. The Iron Bank is always glad to be of service. The banker bowed. As he left, another... So that's the cool thing about the banker. Like, Stannis throws, you know, kind of a... Not an insult, but he's just, save your pleasantries. It's coin I need, not empty courtesy. And he's all, it would be my pleasure. The Iron Bank is always glad to be of service. So you can see, like, Tycho Nestoris has a completely different vibe than... <laughs> than uh, than anybody else around on the scene. Everyone else is like starved and desperate and he's just doing his little banker routine, you know. His, his customer service face is, is fully on. So if any of you guys worked customer service, you know what the customer service face is. Oh yes. So as he left, another entered, a knight. The king's knights had been coming and going all night, Theon recalled dimly. This one seemed to be the king's familiar. Um, and remember, Stannis is a Night King character so when it says the king's knights have been coming and going all night, I think we're I think George is trying to get us to think about that knight knigget wordplay. <laughs> you know, knight is in night time, knigget as in K-I-A K-N-I-G-H-T knight. Uh, <laughs> so of course the knight king was a knight, et cetera, et cetera. Blah 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 blah. So Stannis has his knights coming and going all night. Maybe that's Night King stuff. Who knows? Theon recalled dimly, see, this one seemed to be the king's familiar. Lean, dark-haired, hard-eyed, his face marred by pockmarks and old scars like a moon. He was. He wore a faded surcoat embroidered with three moths. Sire, he announced, the maester is without, and Lord Arnoff sends word that he would be most pleased to break his fast with you. The son is well, and the grandsons. Lord Wall seeks audience as well. He wants, I know what he wants, the king indicated Theon. Him. Wall wants him dead. Flint, Nori, all of them will want him dead. For the boys he slew. Vengeance for the precious Ned. Will you oblige them? Just now the turncloak is more used to me alive. He has knowledge we may need. Bring in this maester. <clears throat> the king plucked a parchment off the table and squinted over it. A letter, Theon knew. Its broken seal was black wax, hard and shiny. I know what that says, he thought, giggling. So here we go, Theon again, like, <laughs> he's like giggling on the wall. And then it says, Stannis looked up, the turncloak stirs. Theon, my name is Theon. He had to remember his name. I know your name. I know what you did. I saved her. The outer wall of Winterfell was 80 feet high, but beneath the spot where he had jumped, the snows had piled up to a depth of more than 40. A cold white pillow. The girl had taken the worst of it. Jane. Her name is Jane, but she will never tell them. Theon had landed on top of her and broken some of her ribs. I saved the girl, he said. We flew. Stannis snorted. You fell. Umber saved her. If Morris Crowfoot and his men had not been outside the castle, Bolton would have had you both of you back in moments. <clears throat> so here's a little more symbolism here. Sorry to break up the narrative so much, but falling and flying, that's obvious Greenseer talk, right? Brands, Greenseer dream. He's falling, and then at the last second, he flies. And then we have all the people pushed out of the, the moon door made of weirwood in the Eyrie, which is referred to as flying, even though they're actually falling. So we've identified this as a, as a green seer dichotomy, falling and flying. So Theon, what is this about? Theon is probably a last hero figure here. He's a, he's a Stark. He's been basically symbolically killed and resurrected. He was resurrected by Bran and the Weirwood Tree in the sense that Bran and the Weirwood Tree gave him his name back. So he's very much like a broken last hero Night's Watchman figure who's been resurrected. That's, that's what his symbolism is. 
<clears throat> and as I mentioned in the Prince of Winterfell chapter, he looks at his gray skin and thinks a Stark at last. And he's also got gray hair too. So he's turning into a gray king figure, but also an honorary Stark. And of course the gray king is, is an ironborn myth, but it all has to do with weirwood symbolism. So essentially that's what Theon is doing. He is playing the role of an honorary Stark, a last hero, Night's Watchman, something like that. He's been killed, broken, resurrected, again, symbolically, by Bran in the Weirwood Tree. And so when he escapes Winterfell and saves a Night's Queen figure who looks very much like a victim, Jane Poole, she's described as being like a corpse and you know having cold, clammy flesh and ice white, this and that. So she's a very clear Night Queen figure. And here's a last hero essentially saving her right? They're like jumping out of a castle, out of a prison place, and they're either falling or flying. So this kind of sounds like the last hero rescuing Nissa Nissa turned Night's Queen out of the Weirwood Nest or something like that. Or maybe Jane Poole is supposed to be like the stolen other baby, perhaps, kind of like baby monster that Sam and Gilly rescue from Craster, who of course is a stand-in for the Night's King because he gives his children to the others to be made into others. So it's, it's one of those two things, um, but certainly Theon is a rescuer figure here. So he's rescuing Jane Poole, who might be a Nissa Nissa figure, or who might be, like I said, a, a, you know, we're supposed to see them as a child of Knights, King and Queen, a child that's supposed to be given to the others, but is instead rescued, right? Let me uh, let me go get my cockatoo, guys. Um, she's uh, she hasn't had enough out time today, so I need to go get her. I'm gonna leave Noisy Goose back there, though. Hang on a second. I'll put up some more Theon artwork for you to look at while I'm gone. Let's keep it entertaining. Yes. What do we got this time? Ooh, I know. We'll do the Theon Greyjoy uh, Jane Poole wedding by Sam Hogg. This is a horrible scene, but a great piece of art really captures it. Blam. And once again, this is Sam Hogg. This is from the, the latest calendar, I believe. And I'll even zoom in on this a touch. There you go. Be right back. All right, guys, one second. I'm I'm back. Uh, we're still looking at the artwork here, but I am back. It's a pretty good one, huh? Let me see if I can actually zoom in on this so you can get some of the detail. There's a lot of detail in this one. You can see, um, oh, we're zoomed in too much. Back out a little bit. So there is Theon in his squid cloak and jane pool fake aria and then you could see ramsey standing back there at the wind at the tree with the sigils and there's some dogs all the people the snowy gods would so pretty good stuff there And a cockatoo. Hey, girl. 
Are you happy now? Are you happy? She's happy. All right. Thanks for bearing with me, guys. I do not not yet have a parrot assistant for live streaming. There you go. So again, Theon is what the thing I like about Theon escaping with Jane Poole here to step away from the symbolism and just talk about the plot. So Theon is kind of pathetic, right? Like he's not he's not like Jamie Lannister hero <laughs> material or even Jon Snow hero material. He's kind of sad. And so he escaped with Jane Poole, but like he landed on top of her. Like it's not very gentlemanly, right? He landed on top of her and broke her ribs. Like, come on, Theon. <laughs> so it's just one of those like, George always wants to remind us that like, it kind of feels like a song or a story, but it but it's it's never fairy tale perfect. It's never clean, you know, and and easy. It's like no, he yeah he saved her, but uh, <laughs> he landed on her ribs. Come on, Theon. <laughs> Anyways, uh, hanging out outside with the dog, listening to LML read and praising Garth. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, I was just doing a bit of that, as you all probably heard. And then we've got a couple super chats. Thanks, guys. Our PayPal is coming in here. Uh, Adam says, watching Breaking Bad. Quinn's idea said you should ask him. I'm Darth Locus. You banned me from your comments. <laughs> okay, well, you know, uh, I'm sometimes quick on the ban hammer. Um, I do believe in cult, you know, curating your social media experience. However, uh, this is your, this is good sport. It's good sport here. You're, you're politely requesting an unban. So, Darth Locus, I will, I will unban you. I will, I will take a look. I do not remember why. I have no idea. Uh, I will assume it was something small and that I misjudged and I will give you another shot. How about that? All right. Thanks. Thanks for the PayPal. I do appreciate that. Um, let's see here. And then one from Adam also again, telling me to watch Breaking Bad. Okay. All right. All right. I am enjoying Ozarks at the moment or Ozark, I guess is singular. Uh, we're like two seasons into that. It's, uh, lots of fun money laundering stuff going on. Um, Let's see here. Okay, so one thing, uh, Adam, let me do me a favor, though. Just be patient with me. I will get you after the stream, okay? it's I got to go into a couple of menus in order to unban you. It's not easy um, for me to do right now, but I will do it after the stream, I promise. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's see here. So Theon lands on top of Jane. He's like, oh, I saved her. You know, um, and then Stannis snorted. He's like, you fell. Umber saved her if Moores and his men hadn't been outside the castle. Now, that's Moores Crowfood and his green boys. Remember, Moores Crowfood, who has one eye, has a dragon glass eye, um, which is great uh, symbolism, which I don't, I don't want to get sidetracked on. Um, he has the green boys, right? Like his old men and his, he took a bunch of basically people that were almost too young to go out and join the main army but they're running around and setting traps in the snow and making noise all night with uh, with the horns and just trying to trying to drive the Boltons crazy, which they do. And then when they charge out of the castle, some of them fall in the traps and pits. Um, and then they also, of course, rescue Theon and Jane after they jump off the castle wall. So Morse Crowfoot, a very cool player in the Winterfell um, uh, Battle of Winterfell drama, and of course. If you haven't seen the Battle of Winterfell Winds of Winter preview that I did with Quinn, definitely check that out. We went over the entire battle and all the players and all that stuff. Crow Food's definitely one to keep an eye on. Uh, and of course, symbolism-wise, he's he's a just think about him as being like Blood Raven in battle. Blood Raven has one red eye that's like a coal. Blood Raven is a dragon, but he's also a green seer. So Morris Crow Food, he is a crow pecked out one of his eyes, right? So this is a tie into Bran's Odin symbolism of the bad little boy who climbed too high and had his eyes pecked out and the three-eyed raven pecking open Bran's third eye. So Moore's crow food, one of his eyes was pecked out by a crow and then he stuck a hunk of dragon glass in there. But of course, dragon glass, as we all know, is also the same thing that goes in glass candles. A glass candle is just a tall, thin piece of dragon glass. And the glass candle enables what? Sight, magical sight. So putting a dragon glass hunk in place of a missing eye 
it, symbolism wise, this is implying him as a seer, a dragon seer, something like that. So again, it's the same symbolism as Blood Raven, a white haired winter warrior in the north, but who has magical sight and dragon symbolism. That's Moore's crow food. So he's basically telling us about the green seer archetype, which again, I maintain goes all the way back to Azor High, a dragon person who forced his way into the Weirwoods and stole the power of the green seers, essentially became the first human magician to invade the Weirwood net. And Blood Raven and Bran and all the human green seers are in a way following in his footsteps. Um, now, I believe that Blood Raven and Bran aren't necessarily evil. I think they're sort of maintaining something that's, you know, has been messed up since Azor Ahai came into the Weirwood Net. And I think Bran's job will be to help close it down and remove the human presence from the Weirwood Net. However, um, what were we talking about? Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Ah, the symbolism of the Green Seer archetype, the three eyed crow or the head Green Seer archetype always has dragon symbolism. That's why Blood Raven, even before George knew who Blood Raven was going to be, he knew that the three eyed crow and that the green seer that Bran was going to see would be a Targaryen. It was very important that the green seer of the story was a dragon because again, he's been it's just an important thing. He's been setting that up the whole time. So all the green seer characters are going to show us dragon symbolism. And that is why Morris Crowfood has the dragon glass eye. And that's why he has a bunch of green boys in his army. So think of Azor High and a bunch of green men or a bunch of children of the forest who are children, just like these are boys and they're green because they're associated with green seer stuff. Okay, you get this. All right, let's go back to the chapter. So that's Morris Crowfood. Um, Crow food. Theon remembered an old man, huge and powerful, with a ruddy face and a shaggy white beard. He had been seated on a garren, clad in the pelt of a gigantic snow bear, its head his hood. Under it, he wore a stained white leather eye patch that reminded Theon of his uncle Euron. He'd want, he wanted to rip it off Umber's face to make sure that underneath was only an empty socket and not a black eye shining with malice. Instead, he had whimpered through his broken teeth and said, I am. A turncloak and a kinslayer, Crowfoot had finished. You will hold that lying tongue or lose it. But Umber had looked at the girl closely, squinting down with his one good eye. You are the younger daughter? And Jane had nodded. Arya, my name is Arya. Arya of Winterfell, aye. When last I was inside those walls, your cook served us a steak and kidney pie. Made with ale, I think, best I ever tasted. What was his name, that cook? Gage, Jane said at once. He was a good cook. He would make lemon cakes for Sansa whenever we had lemons. Crowfood had fingered his beard. Dead now, I suppose. That smith of yours as well, a man who knew his steel. What was his name? Jane had hesitated. Micken, Theon thought. His name was Micken. The castle blacksmith had never made any lemon cakes for Sansa, which made him far less important than the castle cook in the sweet little world she had shared with her friend, Jane Poole. Remember, damn you. Your father was the steward. He had charge of the whole household. The, sniss, the smith's name was Micken. Micken, Micken. I had him put to death before me. Micken, Jane said. Moore's umber had grunted. Aye. What he might have said or done next, Theon never learned, for that was when the boy ran up, clutching a spear and shouting that the portcullis on Winterfell's main gate was rising. And how Crowfood had grinned at that. Theon twisted in his chains and blinked down at the king. Crowfood found us, yes. He sent us here to save you. Or he sent us here to you, but it was me who saved her. Ask her yourself. He would tell him. Or she would tell him. Sorry. She would tell him. You saved me, Jane had whispered, as she was carrying her through the snow. She was pale with pain, but she had brushed one hand across his cheek and smiled. I saved Lady Arya, Theon whispered back at her. And then all at once, more Zumber's spears were all around them. Is this my thanks? He asked Stannis kicking feebly against the wall. <clears throat> his shoulders were in agony. His own weight was tearing them from their sockets. How long had he, had he been hanging here? Was it still night outside? The tower was windowless. He had no way to know. Unchain me and I will serve you. As you served Roose Bolton and Rob Stark, Stannis snorted. I think not. We have a warmer end in mind for you, Turncloak, but not until we're done with you. He means to kill me. The thought was queerly comforting. 
Death did not frighten Theon Greyjoy. Death would mean an end to the pain. Be done with me then, he urged the king. Take off my head and stick it on a spear. I slew Lord Eddard's sons. I ought to die. But do it quick. He is coming. Who is coming? Bolton? Lord Ramsay, Theon hissed. The son, not the father. You must not let him take me. You must not... What? <clears throat> oh, it's a typo. It's not my fault. Sorry. The son, not the father. You must not let him take me. Roos. Roos is safe within the walls of Winterfell with his new fat wife. Ramsay is coming. Ramsay Snow, you mean, the bastard. Never call him that. Spittle sprayed from Theon's lips. Ramsay Bolton, not Ramsay Snow. Never Snow, never. You have to remember his name or he will hurt you. He's welcome to try, whatever name he goes by. The door opened with a gust of cold black wind and a swirl of snow. The Knight of the Moths had returned with the maester the king had sent for, his gray robes concealed beneath a heavy bearskin pelt. Behind him came two other knights, each carrying a raven in a cage. One was the man who'd been with Asha when the banker delivered her, him to her, a burly man with a winged pig on his surcoat. That's Clayton Suggs, I believe. The other was taller, broad-shouldered, and brawny. The big man's breastplate was silver, silvered steel inlaid with niello. Though scratched and dented, it still shone in the candlelight. The cloak that he wore over it was fastened with a burning heart. <clears throat> Alan Thompson with a super chat. Does the Greyjoy name have any deeper symbolism than the Ironborn mindset of I don't give a fuck? <laughs> Could it be a dualism reference for their religion of absolutes? Um... No, it strikes me as just a very grim kind of a name, just like the Stark name, Grey Joy. You know, I think it's a vibe thing mostly. Or like an unvibe thing. <laughs> so, Stannis, uh, not afraid, <laughs> obviously of the Boltons. Welcome to try whatever name he goes by. So the door opens, in comes the maester and the two other knights. They're carrying ravens in a cage. Maester Tybald announced the knight of the moths. The maester sank to his knees. He was red haired and round shouldered with close set eyes that kept flickering toward Theon hanging on the wall. Your grace, how may I be of service? Stannis did not reply at once. He studied the man before him, his brow furrowed. Get up. The maester rose. You are maester at the Dreadfort. How is it you are here with us? Lord Arnoff brought me to tend to his wounded. To his wounded or his ravens? Both, your grace. Both. Stannis snapped the word out. A maester's raven flies to one place and one place only. Is that correct? The maester mopped sweat from his brow with his sleeve. N not entirely, Your Grace. Most, most, yes. Some few can be taught to fly between two castles. Such birds are greatly prized. And once in a very great while, we find a raven who can learn the names of three or four or five castles and fly to each upon command. Birds as clever as that come along only once in a hundred years. Stannis gestured at the black birds in the cages. These two are not so clever, I presume. No, no, Your Grace. Would that it were so. Tell me then. Where are these two trained to fly? Maester Tybalt did not answer. Theon Greyjoy kicked his feet feebly and laughed under his breath. Caught! Answer me. If we were to loose these birds, would they return to the Dreadfort? The king leaned forward. Or might they fly for Winterfell instead? Maester Tybalt pissed his robes. Theon could not see the dark stain spreading from where he hung, but the smell of piss was sharp and strong. Maester Tybalt has lost his tongue, Stannis observed to, the, to his knights. Godry, how many cages did you find? Three, Your Grace, said the big knight in a silvered breastplate. One was empty. Your Grace, my, my order is sworn to serve. We I know all about your vows. What I want to know is what was in the letter that you sent to Winterfell. Did you perchance tell Lord Bolton where to find us? Uh, sire, round-shouldered Tybalt drew himself up proudly. The rules of my order forbid me to divulge the contents of Lord Arnoff's letters. Your vows are stronger than your bladder, it would seem. Your grace must understand. Must I? The king shrugged. If you say so. You are a man of learning, after all. 
I had a maester on Dragonstone who was almost a father to me. I have great respect for your order and its vows. Sir Clayton does not share my feelings, though. He learned all he knows in the winds of Flea Bottom. Were I to put you in his charge, he might strangle you with your own chain or scoop your eye out with a spoon. Only the one, your grace, volunteered the balding knight, him of the winged pig. I'd leave to other. <clears throat> How many eyes does a maester need to read a letter? Asked Stannis. One should, one should suffice, I'd think. I would not wish to leave you unable to fulfill your duties to your lord. Roose Bolton's men may well be on their way to attack us even now, however, so you must understand if I skimp on certain courtesies. I will ask you once again, what was in the message you sent to Winterfell? The maester quivered. I'm a map, your grace. The king leaned back in his chair. Get him out of here, he commanded. Leave the ravens. A vein was throbbing in his neck. Confine this gray wretch to one of the huts until I decide what is to be done with him. It will be done, the big knight declared. The maester vanished in another blast of cold and snow. Only the knight of the three moths remained. So right here, I'll just pause. Uh, you see why Theon started laughing? And you also see why, uh, as soon as the maester came in, he was sort of glancing uneasily at Theon on the wall because he already knows, like, Theon knows what's up. Theon was there when Ramsay was doing this plotting. Theon overheard the Karstark's plot to betray Stannis. So he has already informed on these people to Stannis, I'm pretty sure. And Stannis is sussing it out, essentially. So, we are hot on the trail. This part's going to be even funnier. <clears throat> Stannis glowered. Oh, sorry. Stannis glowered up at Theon where he hung. You were not the only turn cloak here, it would seem. Would that all the lords in the Seven Kingdoms had but a single neck. <laughs> That's a great Stannis line. Would but all the lords in the Seven Kingdoms had but a single neck. And just chop them all off at once. He turned to his knight. Sir Richard, while I'm breaking fast with Lord Arnoff, you are to disarm his men and take them into custody. Most will be asleep. Do them no harm unless they resist. It may be that they did not know. Question some, of, question some upon that point. But sweetly, if they had no knowledge of this treachery, they shall have the chance to prove their loyalty. He snapped a hand in dismissal. Send in Justin Massey. Another night, Theon knew, when Massey entered. This one was fair, with a neatly trimmed blonde beard and thick straight hair so pale it seemed more white than gold. Secret Targaryen! No, just kidding. His tunic bore the triple spiral, an ancient sigil for an ancient house. And I gotta pull this up real quick. Uh, house Massey. Sigil. Triple spiral. Yes, yes. Let's try Ketra. Let me just share the screen. Do 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 do. Where is it? Um, this one. Yeah, there we go. Massey of the Stormland. So you see the triple spiral, and it's also got the red, blue, and green such as we see at the trident with the three branches of the of the trident. <laughs> Somebody called Secret Targaryen popped up in the chat. Was that already your name or is that somebody moving fast there? That's funny. <laughs> so yeah, House Massey. Um, it's a triple goddess symbol, symbol of magical power. It's also a water symbol. Uh, the goddess Danu uh, has that symbol associated with her. We talked about that in the Vedic Danu video. Um, and in the Song of Ice and Fire, obviously red, green, and blue are kind of like the three major forms of magic, ice, fire, and green seer magic. So here we have House Massey, blah, 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 blah. I love sigils. Back to the script. Okay. I was told your grace have need of me, he said, from one knee. Stannis nodded. You will escort the Bravosi banker back to the wall. Choose six good men and take 12 horses. To ride or eat? The king was not amused. I want you gone before midday, sir. 
Lord Bolton could be on us at any moment, and it's imperative that the banker return to Bravos. You shall accompany him across the narrow sea. If there's to be a battle, my place is here with you. Your place is where I say it is. I have 500 swords as good as you or better, but you have a pleasing manner and a glib tongue, and those will be of more use to me at Bravos than here. The Iron Bank, and that's, I love Stannis. That's Stannis's way of giving another dude a compliment. You have a pleasing manner and a glib tongue. It's basically saying, you're a hottie and you're charming, so I'm sending you because you're eye candy. So I just like that. It's kind of funny. <clears throat> pleasing manner and a glib tongue, Sir Justin. Or uh, what is it? Um, yeah, Justin Massey. Let's see here. Um... The Iron Bank has opened its coffers to me. You will collect their coin and hire ships and sell swords. A company of good repute, if you can find one. The Golden Company would be my first choice, but they're not already under. If they are not already under contract, seek for them in the disputed lands, if need be. But first, hire as many swords as you can find in Bravos and send them to me by way of Eastwatch. Archers as well. We need more bows. So these are interesting plans here that Stannis is making. Um. First of all, this is a very important mission that Justin Massey is being sent on. I mean, this is kind of a, imagine you were being sent here, you know, get on a ship with the banker, go to Bravos, find some ships and sell swords and hire them. Try to find a company if you can, maybe go to the disputed lands. And it's all like, I mean, that's pretty big ask here. Uh, Justin Massey is going to have to use ingenuity He's going to have to use creativity, resourcefulness. He might he might run into roadblocks and have to work around them. He's going to have to do diplomacy. So it really is a pretty big job. And Stannis is pretty smart to pick somebody with a glib tongue and a pleasing manner, such as he's doing here. So <clears throat> pretty cool plan that he's making and a big responsibility that he's setting on Justin Massey's shoulders here. And uh, also he's having the soldiers sent to Eastwatch. So Stannis fully plans on winning this battle and getting back up to the wall to take care of the real fight, which is presumably against the others. So Stannis is planning ahead. He's not planning to die. Um, that is worth pointing out. Sir Justin's hair had fallen down across one eye. He pushed it back and said, The captains of the free companies will join a lord more readily than a mere knight, your grace. I hold neither lands nor title. Why should they sell their swords to me? Go to them with both fists full of golden dragons, the king said in an acid tone. That should prove persuasive. 20,000 men should suffice. Do not return with fewer. <laughs> Stannis with the fewer again. Sire, might I speak freely? So long as you speak quickly. Your grace should go to Bravos with the banker. <clears throat> Is that your counsel, that I should flee? The king's face darkened. That was your counsel on the Blackwater as well, I recall. When the battle turned against us, I let you and Horp shivvy me back to Dragonstone like a whipped cur. The day was lost, your grace. Aye, that was what you said. The day is lost, sire. Fall back now that you may fight again. And now you would have me scamper off across the narrow sea to raise an army, aye, as Bittersteel did after the Battle of Redgrass Field when Damon Blackfire fell. <clears throat> Do not prate of me of history, sir. Damon Blackfire was a rebel and a usurper, Bittersteel a bastard. When he fled, he swore he would return to place a son of Damon's upon the Iron Throne. He never did. Words are wind, and the wind that blows exiles across the narrow sea seldom blows them back. That boy Viserys Targaryen spoke of return as well. He slipped through my fingers at Dragonstone, only to spend his life wheedling after sellswords. The beggar king, they called him in the free cities. Well, I do not beg, nor will I flee again. I am Robert's heir, the rightful king of Westeros. My place is with my men. Yours is in Bravos. Go with the banker and do as I have bid. As you command, Sir Justin. So there's, there's Stannis's dad voice for you. <laughs> it's just like, <clears throat> just, just regulating, laying down the law. Uh, no, nice idea, but no, we're going to do what I said. And here's why I get out of my sight. So also an interesting commentary here, the wind that blows exiles across the narrow sea seldom blows them back. That's very true. However, he just mentioned the golden company, right? 
And of course, the Golden Company is now in the hands of my name is Fagon, aka Young Griff, aka Aegon Blackfire, aka Fagon. So he has the Golden Company, and he, of course, is a Blackfire. So Damon Blackfire, Bitter Steel, true. They didn't come back to Westeros, but their descendant is coming back to Westeros with the Golden Company. Um, so that's a little interesting sort of reference to all of that here, very subtly. And, uh, oh gosh, I'm without vitamin water. Hang on a second, guys. I'm actually going to try something a little different. Try some orange juice. I thought maybe that helped my throat a little better. I think it might work. Mm. Yeah, it's still yellow. It's uh, it's Tropicana. Oh, guys, uh, one thing about my new camera, if I could just take a minute, is the new camera has a, has a better autofocus. So, for example, when I put something up close, you can actually see it. So here's my cool pendant that I got with the sunstone and the Sri Yantra, which is, of course, on a pine cone slice. And now you can see all the cool detail. And I can show you things like, uh, like my black tourmaline that I was talking about the other day. Get it to focus. There we go. Ah, yes, black tourmaline. And this is the meteorite that I have which has uh, some lithium in it. Focus, focus. I need to, I was, ah, I was working so well. Come on, come on, come on. There you go. So you can see those little, the metallic bits in there. This is, very, is a very heavy rock. Let me tell you, it's the heaviest, by far the heaviest, densest, rock that i have you can tell it's a meteorite it is thick oh yeah you can see that flash there the iron so in any case fun with the new camera. <clears throat> all right so let's see here um my camera also has adhd at least the patient said well at least it does it does it eventually gets it so better than before all right um <clears throat> as you command, Sir Justin said, it may be that we shall lose this battle, the king said grimly. In Bravos, you may hear that I am dead. It may even be true. You shall find my sellswords nonetheless. The knight hesitated. Your grace, if you are dead, you will avenge my death and seat my daughter on the Iron Throne or die in the attempt. Sir Justin put one hand on his sword hilt. On my honor as a knight, you have my word. Oh, and take the Stark girl with you. Deliver her to Lord Commander Snow on your way to Eastwatch. Stannis tapped the parchment that lay before him. A true king pays his debts. Pay it, I thought Theon. Pay it with false coin. Jon Snow would see through the, uh, the imposter at once. Lord Stark's sullen bastard had known Jane Poole, and he had always been fond of his little half-sister, Arya. The Black Brothers will accompany you as far as Castle Black, the king went on. The Iron Men are to remain here, supposedly to fight for us. Another gift from Tycho Nestoris. Just as well. They would only slow you down. Iron Men were made for ships, not horses. Lady Arya should have a female companion as well. Take Alisanne Mormont. Sir Justin pushed back his hair again. And Lady Asha? The king considered that for a moment. No. <clears throat> One day your grace will need to take the Iron Islands. That will go much easier with Balin Greyjoy's daughter as a cat's paw, with one of your own leal men as her lord husband. You, the king scowled, the woman is wed, Justin. A proxy marriage, never consummated, easily set aside. The groom is old besides, like to die soon. From a sword through his belly, if you have your way, Sir Worm. Theon knew how these knights thought. That was Theon's inner monologue, of course. Stannis pressed his lips together. Serve me well in this matter of the cell swords, and you may have what you desire. Until such time, the woman must needs remain my captive. 
Sir Justin bowed his head. I understand. That only seemed to irritate the king. Your understanding is not required. Only your obedience. Be on your way, sir. This time, when the knight took his leave, the world beyond the door seemed more white than black. Stannis Baratheon paced the floor. The tower was a small one, dank and cramped. A few steps brought the king around to Theon. How many men does Bolton have at Winterfell? Five thousand. Six. More. He gave the king a ghastly grin, all shattered teeth and splinters. More than you. How many of those does he like to send against us? <clears throat> no more than half. That was a guess, admittedly, but it felt right to him. Roos Bolton was not a man to blunder blindly out into the snow, map or no. He would hold his main strength in reserve, keep his best men with him, trust in Winterfell's massive double wall. The castle was too crowded. Men were at each other's throats, the Manderleys and Freys especially. It's them his lordship sent after you, the ones that he's well rid of. Why, well, I'm in Manderley. The king's mouth twisted in contempt. Lord, too fat to sit a horse. Too fat to come to me, yet he comes to Winterfell. Too fat to bend the knee and swear me his sword, yet now he wields that sword for Bolton. I sent my onion knight to treat with him, and Lord too fat butchered him and mounted his head and hands on the walls of White Harbor for the phrase to gloat over. And the phrase, has the Red Wedding been forgotten? So this is um poor Stannis. He thinks his sweet Davos is been murdered, and of course Davos hasn't. <clears throat> that was a fake onion knight, head and hands, that's been put over the gate, of course. Um, and yeah, asking the same question that Davos did. Has the Red Wedding been forgotten? And of course it has not, because the North remembers. Ah, and that's what Theon says. The North remembers. The Red Wedding, Lady Hornwood's fingers, the sack of Winterfell, Deepwood Mott, and Torn Square, they remember all of it. Bran and Rickon. They were only Miller's boys. Frey and Manderley will never combine their strengths. They will come for you, but separately. Lord Ramsay will not be far behind them. He wants his bride back. He wants his reek. Theon's laugh was half a titter, half a whimper. Lord Ramsay is the one your grace should fear. Stannis bristled at that. I defeated your uncle Victorian and his iron fleet off Fair Isle the first time your father crowned himself. I held Storm's End against the power of the Reach for a year and took Dragonstone from the Targaryens. I smashed Mance Raider at the wall, though he had 20 times my numbers. Tell me, Turncloak, what battles has the bastard of Bolton ever won that I should fear him? You must not call him that. A wave of pain washed over Theon Greyjoy. He closed his eyes and grimaced. When he opened them again, he said, You do not know him. No more than he knows me. Knows me, cried one of the ravens the maester had left behind. It flapped its big black wings against the bars of its cage. Knows, it cried again. Stannis turned. Stop that noise. Of course, Stannis doesn't like bird noise. Fucking Stannis. Can't even, like, the raven squawks one time and he, like, gets upset. Come on, dude. <clears throat> Cameron says, unrelated to Theon chapter, um, so it can wait to the end. I've been watching your old podcast. Can you clear up the timeline of Azor Highness and of the Long Night last hero events? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, that's an easy question. Um, <laughs> I'll just tackle that real quick. Uh, so, look, um, the actually, the real answer for this, Cameron, is going to be in the live stream called Timeline Heresies, the Hammer of the Waters, uh, the Pact in the Hammer of the Waters, that's what it's called. And that gives my whole timeline of events, how everything sort of connects together. It's kind of my overarching theory video. So check that one out. Timeline Heresies, the Pact in the Hammer of the Waters. <clears throat> the very short answer is it all happened around the long night. All these myths that we're hearing about that seem to be scattered basically all talking about the same series of events and actions. Those are the ones that are important that we need to figure out. So that's the short answer. And one second, guys, I need to do something. Speaking of Garth, have a look at Theon again.
We do routines and choreograph scenes of footwork and back cable. For opera, Madame Camelot, I have to push the pedal. Ah. Mm. Hi, people says, hey, this is off topic, but I've seen the possible inspiration for both the White Walkers and Aria's, Aria's story in the Wendigo myth. Skinwalkers, uh, Wendigo. I've heard that name, but I don't know what it's about. So I will have to do that research. Although chat, feel free to pipe up if you know what that is. What's up with the Wendigo? I do not only heard the name it's something creepy but that uh that's all i know sorry apologies so stannis doesn't like the raven he says stop that noise and then it says behind him the door opened the car starks had arrived <coughs> bent and twisted the castellan of carhold leaned heavily on his cane as he made his way to the table Lord Arnoff's cloak was fine gray wool, bordered in black sable and clasped with a silver starburst. A rich garment, Theon thought, on a poor excuse for a man. He had seen that cloak before, he knew, just as, as he had seen the man who wore it. At the Dreadfort, I remember, he sat and supped with Lord Ramsay and Horsebane Umber the night they brought Reek up from his cell. The man beside him could only be his son. Fifty, Theon judged, with a round, soft face like his father's if Lord Arnoff went to fat. Behind him walked three younger men, the grandsons, he surmised. One wore a chainmail burney. The rest were dressed for breakfast, not for battle. Fools. Your grace. Arnoff Koshtark bowed his head. An honor. He looked for a seat. Instead, his eyes found Theon. And who is this? Recognition came a heartbeat later. Lord Arnoff paled. So he figured it out right away. As soon as he sees Theon, he's like, oh shit. Oh shit. Because he remembers, like I said, he remembers Theon was there. He heard all of this plotting. And if Stannis has Theon, then Stannis may well know of all this treachery. So Arnoff realizes he's just stepped right into it, essentially. Um, and then real quick on the Wendigo... Native American myth about cannibalism. You get hungry in the cold, and then a cannibal spirit comes to you and is like, why not try the long pig? Which, of course, means human meat. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, there's definitely uh, a lot of cannibalism stuff, folklore, let's call it, <laughs> going on in A Song of Ice and Fire. It's one of those things that I tend to look away from because it's just kind of gnarly. Uh, but it's there for sure. So I'll have to do a little more research on that. Uh, so uh, Arnoff pales when he sees Theon. Um, and then his stupid son remained oblivious. There are no chairs, the oaf observed. One of the ravens screamed inside its cage. Only mine, King Stannis, sat in it. It is no Iron Throne, but here and now it suits. A dozen men had filed through the tower door, led by the Knight of the Moths and the big man in the silvered breastplate. You are dead men, understand that, the king went on. Only the manner of your dying remains to be determined. You would be well advised not to waste my time with denials. Confess, and you shall have the same swift end that the young wolf gave Lord Rickard. Lie, and you will burn. Choose. I choose this. One of the grandsons seized his sword hilt and made to draw it. That proved to be a poor choice. The grandson's blade had not even cleared its scabbard before two of the king's knights were on him. It ended with his forearm flopping in the dirt and blood spurting from his stump, and one of his brothers stumbling for the stairs, clutching a belly wound. He staggered up six steps before he fell and came crashing back down to the floor. Neither Arnoff Karstark nor his son had moved. So kind of a cold moment there. All the way around. This is some Mafia Dawn shit, right? Like, Stannis, like, just straight up 
pulls out the Trump card, the boss card. And he's like, look, you guys are all dead. Know that. The only thing we're talking about here is how I'm going to kill you. You can burn or you can get your head chopped off like, you know, like Rob Stark did for your other fucking traitor relative, essentially, is what he's saying. Um, so, yeah, that's hardcore. And then you see Grandpa and Dad don't even move when the grandsons decide to do their foolish display of valor. Like, they're like, yeah, that shit's on you. Uh, I'm not moving. <laughs> Um, so this is definitely like a scene where the mafia boss pulls a gun out on the underlings who've been betraying him. And he's like, you know, demanding information, threatening to kill him, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I've been watching Ozarks lately. <laughs> uh, but this is that kind of scene. Definitely um, some hardcore shit. And then so one guy gets his arm chopped off. The other one gets a belly wound and sort of climbs up the stairs and then falls off. So. You can really sort of picture this little mini bouts of mayhem breaking out in the middle of the scene. Um, Arnoff didn't move. His son didn't move. And then it says, take them away, the king commanded. The sight of them sours my stomach. Within moments, the five men had been bound and removed. The one who had lost his sword arm had fainted from loss of blood. But his brother with the belly wound screamed loud enough for both of them. That is how I deal with betrayal, turn cloak, Stannis informed Theon. My name is Theon. As you will. Tell me, Theon, how many men did Moore's Umber have with him at Winterfell? None. No men. He grinned at his own wit. He had boys. I saw them. Aside from a handful of half-crippled sergeants, the warriors that Crowfood had brought down from Last Hearth were hardly old enough to shave. Their spears and axes were older than the hands that clutched them. It was Horsebane Umber who had the men inside the castle. I saw or it was Horsebane Umber who had the men inside the castle. I saw them too, old men, every one, Theon tittered. Morris took the green boys and Hothor took the graybeards. All the real men went with the gray John and died at the red wedding. Is that what you wanted to know, your grace? King Stannis ignored the jibe. Boys, was all he said, disgusted. Boys will not hold Lord Bolton long. Not long, Theon agreed. Not long at all. Not long, cried the graven from its cage. King gave the bird an irritated look. I, <laughs> I feel you, Stannis. <laughs> that Bravosi banker claimed Sir Aeny's fray is dead. Did some boy do that? Twenty green boys with spades, Theon told him. The snow fell heavily for days, so heavily that you could not see the castle walls ten yards away. No more than the men up on the battlements could see what was happening beyond those walls. So Crowfood set his boys to digging pits outside the castle gates, then blew his horn to lure Lord Bolton out. Instead, he got the phrase. The snow had covered up the pits, so they rode right into them. Aenys broke his neck, I heard, but Sir Hostin only lost a horse. More is the pity. He will be angry now. Strangely, Stannis smiled. Angry foes do not concern me. Anger makes men stupid, and Hostin Frey was stupid to begin with. If half of what I have heard of him, have heard of him is true, let him come. He will. Bolton has blundered, the king declared. All he had to do was sit inside his castle whilst we starved. Instead, he has sent out some portion of his strength to give us battle. His knights will be horsed. Ours must fight afoot. His men will be well nourished. Ours will go into battle with empty bellies. It makes no matter. Sir Stupid, Lord Too Fat, the Bastard, let them come. We hold the ground, and I mean to turn that to our advantage. The ground, said Theon. What ground? Here? This misbegotten tower? This wretched little village? You have no high ground here, no walls to hide behind, no natural defenses. Yet. Yet! Both ravens screamed in unison. Then one quarked and the other muttered, Tree! 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 The door opened. Beyond, the world was white. The knight of the three moths entered, his legs caked with snow. He stomped his feet to knock it off and said, Your grace, the Karstarks are taken. A few of them resisted and died for it. Most were confused and yielded quickly. We've herded them all into the long hall and can find them there. Well done. They say they did not know, the ones we've questioned. They would. We might question them more sharply. No, I believe them. Karstar could never have hoped to keep his treachery a secret if he shared his plans with every baseborn man-jack in his service. Some drunken spearman would have let it slip one night whilst laying with a whore. They did not need to know. They are carhold men. 
when the moments came, they would have obeyed their lords as they had done all their lives. As you say, sire. What of your own losses? One of Lord Peasbury's men was killed. Two of mine were wounded. If it please your grace, though, the men are growing anxious. There are hundreds of them gathered around the towers, wondering what's happened. Talk of treason is on every lip. No one knows who to trust or who might be arrested next. The Northmen especially. I need to talk with them. Is Wall still waiting? Him and Artos Flint. Will you see them? Shortly. The Kraken first. As you command, the knight took his leave. So let's back up real quick um, to this, the military strategy. We talked about this in the Battle of Winterfell preview, so I won't go over it too much. But what's going on here is uh, this whole talk of using the ground and Bolton has blundered. We'll be on foot, but it's fine. Stannis is in a tower. Well, if you have to remember the whole setup with the two lakes. So they stopped and camped by these two lakes about three miles away from Winterfell. And uh, again, three miles, but in a snowstorm. So it's really not as close as three miles usually is. The tower is on an island. Uh, no, the tower is on the strip of land that goes between the two lakes. And the weirwood tree is on an island in one of the lakes. And the lakes are frozen over. And what's happened is, as they've been camping there, people have been fishing the lakes. They've been cutting holes in the ice and fishing. And the Northmen know how to do that. So they've been doing that this whole march. Thing is that in the last Stannis chapter, we've already heard that they've fished the lakes out and that the lakes are like Swiss cheese which means there's holes all over the place. So this is called the night lamp theory. And basically what Stannis is going to do is he's going to lure them. Um, he's going to essentially create a fake. He's going to deceive them about where the tower is, where the weirwood tree is. And he's essentially going to lure them out onto the ice so that they can fall in the holes. Not really fall in the holes. I think what the idea is that the ice having so many holes in it when an entire army gets out onto the ice, it will basically collapse the whole thing. The weight will collapse it. So what they're trying to do is essentially create a, a trick and a trap. They're going to they're gonna take an angry foe who's hot on their tail and essentially fight and sort of retreat and lure them out onto the ice so they can fall through the ice. Um, probably what's going to happen is that the Theon said the Manderleys are going to come first and so what's going to happen is the Mandalays are going to come. Um, actually, wait, let me go back. I don't know if it's who comes first or second. The point is there's two separate forces coming out. One is a Mandalays and the other is the Freys and after them, the Bastard. So Mandalays and Freys want to kill each other. We saw that scene in Winterfell when Rams, uh, Roos Bolton was like, saw the Freys, remember the Freys and, uh, and uh, the Mandalays were fighting at the dinner. One of them slashed Wyman Mandalay across the neck, Frey pies, all that stuff. So, and, and obviously the Mandalays were taunting the hell out of the Freys the whole time. So then uh, Roos decided to send those two out. He's like, okay, we're, we're too cooped up. You guys are eager to fight. Go fight Stannis. So what's going to happen out of all this is that your Freys are going to end up in the lake. And your Mandalays, well, we know the Mandalays are waiting for a chance to turn to Stannis anyway. because. Remember, Wyman Manderley sent Davos on that mission to Skagos to find Rickon and is saying, I'll ally with Stannis if you can turn up Rickon. So Manderley doesn't want to ally with the Boltons and he's waiting to betray them. So I think this might be the moment, or at least this is the speculation. It's not even really my idea. Uh, but what's going to happen here is the Manderleys are going to end up on Stannis' side. The phrase will be dead. And by the time the Boltons get there, I think that Team Stannis will be able to use the Manderleys as a deception. Um, you know, the Manderleys can pretend to have captured Stannis. That's one idea <clears throat> and something like that. Um, so there's a few possibilities, but it's going to involve deception and treachery. And we're going to see some cool Manderley moments and cool Stannis moments coming up. So um, let me just pull something up for you. This is a Cantus theory, the night lamp, and he's done it in great detail. He's made maps of everything. 
Um, so I will just drop this link real quick in the chat so you guys can go check that out. Definitely worth reading, guys. High level analysis from Cantus. <clears throat> and the guy goes way in on the detail. Um, so it's 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 really just top notch stuff there. Basically, I regard it as head cannon. So, all right. Um, -de 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 -de. Back to the Theon chapter. So he said, send it the Kraken first, as you command. My sister, Theon thought, my sweet sister. Though he had lost all feeling in his arms, he felt the twisting in his gut. The same as when the bloodless Bravosi banker presented him to Asha as a gift. The memories still rankled. The burly, balding knight who'd been with her had wasted no time shouting for help, so they'd had no more than a few moments before Theon was dragged away to face the king. That was long enough. He had hated the look on Asha's face when she realized who he was, the shock in her eyes, the pity in her voice, the way her mouth twisted in disgust. Instead of rushing forward to embrace him, she had taken half a step backwards. Did the bastard do this to you? She had said. Don't you call him that. Then the words came spilling out of Theon in a rush. He tried to tell her all of it about Reek and the Dreadford and Kyra and the Keys. A Lord Ramsay never took anything but skin unless you begged for it. He took her how he told her how he'd saved the girl leaping from the castle wall into the snow. We flew. Let Abel make a song of that. We flew. And then he had to say who Abel was and talk about the washerwomen who weren't truly washerwomen. By then, Theon knew how strange and incoherent all this sounded, yet somehow the words would not stop. He was cold and sick and tired and weak. So weak, so very weak. She has to understand. She's my sister. He never wanted to do any harm to Bran or Rickon. Reek made him kill those boys. Not him, Reek, but the other one. I am no kinslayer, he insisted. He told her how he bedded down with Ramsay's bitches, warned her that Winterfell was full of ghosts. The swords were gone, four, I think, or five. I don't recall. The Stone Kings are angry. He was shaking by then, trembling like an autumn leaf. The Heart Tree knew my name. The Old Gods. Theon, I heard them whisper. There was no wind, but the leaves were moving. Theon, they said. My name is Theon. It was good to say his name. The more he said it, the less like he was to forget. You have to know your name, he told his sister. You, you told me you were Esgred, but that was a lie. Your name was Asha. It is, his sister had said, so softly that he was afraid that she might cry. Theon hated that. He hated women weeping. Jane Poole had wept all the way from Winterfell to here, wept until her face was purple as a beetroot and the tears had frozen on her cheeks, and all because he had told her that she must be Arya, or else the wolves might send them back. They trained you in a brothel, he reminded her, whispering in her ear so the others would not hear. Jane is the next thing to a whore, but you must go on being Arya. He meant no hurt to her. It was for her own good and his. <clears throat> she has to remember her name. Okay, so this is pretty awful. Let's let's stop and take a minute. Um, Theon is obviously an abused person, a tortured person. And quite frankly, most people that abuse others are abused themselves. And it's basically ends up being a cycle that gets perpetuated. And we can sort of see what that's what's going on here. Theon is is reminding another abused victim essentially to remain a prisoner of that abuse. So he's saying the person you really are is the next thing to a whore. It's no good. You don't even want to be that person. You should be this fake person that they're trying to bully you into being. So it's no wonder the girl is crying. <laughs> I mean, Jane Poole has been through pretty much more than anyone in the story. I mean, she's right up there. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than, than, than these two, really, than Jane and Reek. Like, these two people have been abused by basically the worst person in the story. And that's the thing, though. If you're going to write about abuse, you have to do it accurately. You have to show, and this is what George does, is he shows the fallout. He shows... <clears throat> not just um, the beaten down people, but the way that people internalize it and pass it on. The same thing with Cersei's internalized misogyny. It's the same thing. She's a victim 
but she's now turned into someone who's perpetrating the same thing on other people, perpetuating a cycle. And George is very aware of those sort of cycles of abuse. That's why he talks so much about, <laughs> about uh, parents and all the characters' relationship to their parents. And yes, this is in direct contrast to Dave and Dan. Dave and Dan gave us torture porn. So they showed us the awful torture. They showed us Theon on the cross, you know, Ramsay eating the sausage and coming towards him menacingly with a knife and all this stuff. <clears throat> What's interesting is that in the books, that doesn't happen at all. We don't see any of the torture firsthand. George doesn't have any scenes where Theon is being peeled or amputated or anything. Instead, he gives us Theon broken in a cell, ruminating on his abuse. So instead of, again, torture porn, where you're sort of getting off on the awfulness of the torture, George is concerned with the psychological effects. And that is why it is more effective as a writer for him to not depict the actual scenes, but to spend all the time writing about the aftermath and showing how these characters are broken. And this, this paragraph right here is a really sad, but you know, stunning example of, of how abuse gets internalized. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's pretty awful. It's pretty awful. And by the way, I'm going to start doing, after we finish these Winds of Winter chapters, I'm going to start picking some of my favorite chapters from the book series and doing more of these sort of read-along live streams. Uh, the Prince of Winterfell is a great chapter. It's definitely one of the ones I was thinking about doing. But I'm kind of hesitant because the end has like the worst Ramsey Jane Poole scene uh, in the books. And it's pretty tough. So I'm still thinking about how I'm going to do that. But I do want to read that chapter. We're definitely going to do like The Wayward Bride and just, oh man, we're going to do Davos, you know, in the belly of the whale. And just, yeah, all my favorite chapters. We'll dive into it. We'll go all over the place. Aria, the ghost in Heron Hall chapter is a great one. So, yeah. I won't do anything as tedious as going through every chapter of every book and doing a giant reread, but I do feel like it'll be fun to just pick certain chapters and, and do this. This format seems to be working well. So let's get back to the format. When the tip of her nose, and this is Jane Poole, turned black from frostbite, ugh, and one of the riders from the Night's Watch told her she might lose a piece of it, Jane had wept over that as well. No one will care what Arya looks like so long as she is the heir to Winterfell, he assured her. A hundred men will want to marry her. A thousand. The memory left Theon writhing in his chains. Let me down, he pleaded. Just for a little while. Then you can hang me up again. Stannis Baratheon looked up at him but did not answer. Tree, a raven cried. Tree, tree, tree. Then the other bird said, Theon. Clear as day as Asha came striding through the door. So here it's starting to get weird, right? The ravens are chortling and talking to Theon and talking about a tree. <clears throat> Carl the maid was with her and Christopher Botley. Theon had known Botley since they were boys together back on Pike. Why has she brought her pets? Does she mean to cut me free? That would end the same way as the Karstarks if she tried. The king was displeased by their presence as well. Your guards may wait without. If I meant to harm you, two men would not dissuade me. The Ironborn bowed and retreated. Asha took a knee. Your grace. Oh, sorry. That's not an Asha voice. <laughs> <coughs> I'm Asha Greyjoy. No, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> the Ironborn bowed and retreated. Asha took a knee. Your grace, must my brother be chained like that? It seems a poor reward for bringing you the Stark girl. The king's mouth twitched. You have a bold tongue, my lady. Not unlike your turncloak brother. Thank you, your grace. It was not a compliment. Stannis gave Theon a long look. The village lacks a dungeon, and I have more prisoners than I anticipated when we halted here. He waved Asha to her feet. You may rise. She stood. The Bravosi ransomed my seven... Oh, sorry, another typo, guys. The Bravosi ransomed seven of my men from Lady Glover. I would gladly pay a ransom for my brother. There is not enough gold on all your iron islands. Your brother's hands are soaked with blood. Faring is urging me to give him to R'hllor. Well, that's pretty good weirwood symbolism, right? Red hands soaked with blood, and of course, the leaves of the weirwood tree 
look like bloody hands. So, yes. Theon is to be given to the tree. Faring is urging me to give him to R'hllor. Clayton Suggs as well, I do not doubt. Him, Corliss Penny, all the rest. Even Sir Richard here, who only loves the Lord of Light when it suits his purposes. <clears throat> That's pretty funny. Cynical Stannis is, you know, keeping track of who really believes and who doesn't. Then Asha says, The Red God's choir only knows a single song. So long as the song is pleasing in God's ears, let them sing. Lord Bolton's men will be here sooner than we would wish. Only Morris Umber stands between us, and your brother tells me his levies are made up entirely of green boys. Men like to know their God is with them when they go to battle. Not all your men worship the same God. I'm aware of this. I'm not the fool my brother was. Theon is my mother's last surviving son. When his brothers died, it shattered her. His death will crush what remains of her. But I've not come to beg you for his life. Wise. I'm sorry for your mother, but I do not spare the lives of turncloaks. This one, especially. He slew two of... He's, he slew two sons of Eddard Stark. Every Northman in my service would abandon me if I showed him any clemency. Your brother must die. Then do the deed yourself, your grace. The chill in Asha's voice made Theon shiver in his chains. Take him out across the lake to the islet where the weirwood grows and strike his head off with that sorcerous sword you bear. That is how Eddard Stark would have done it. Theon slew Lord Eddard's sons. Give him to Lord Eddard's gods the old gods of the north. Give him to the tree. And suddenly there came a wild thumping as the maester's ravens hopped and flapped inside their cages, their black feathers flying as they beat against the bars with loud and raucous caws. The tree, one squawked. The tree, the tree. Whilst the second screamed only, Theon, Theon, Theon. Theon Greyjoy smiled. They know my name, he thought. So there you go. And once again, I will share the screen. I'm going to put the cockatoo back. I'm going to grab a new drink. And we're going to give Theon to the tree. The tree, the tree, the tree. All right, I went the other way. Instead of putting Cleo back, I went ahead and got Goose out. I figured since we're in the bird screaming part of the chapter, a little bit of bird screaming would be uh, appropriate or something. So 400 people watching, folks. Thank you very much. I know it's not a normal YouTube channel here, uh, <laughs> but thanks for hanging out. It really does mean a lot. Um, so we'll now open this to questions. We can do questions about Theon and his Winds of Winter plot. Or I guess if you have a couple off-topic questions, we might be able to answer those too. So, yeah. Pretty great chapter, huh? We've got Theon's, like, Theon is basically at his most fun point as a character that he's ever been at. He, um, you know, he, he, was, he started off cocky and arrogant and pretty one-dimensional. 
Then he gets broken down. The Reek stuff is really hard to read, but is an interesting perspective on Winterfell. But now Theon is like really interesting because he's he's gotten enough courage back to sort of dish out some remarks and some one-liners and to have some cutting commentary. So, you know, pretty cool, uh, pretty cool stuff there. And, um, and then there's also the course, the political intrigue with Stannis sussing out the treachery, uh, Stannis playing mafia Don with, with, uh, the car Starks and kind of being a badass here. So we also get the plot to, uh, to send you know to hire the swords from overseas and stuff which is going to come back around i'm sure and have some some uh key role to play in the future mr nobu 1997 says how do you think theon dies so kind of have a feeling he's not gonna die at the tree right i do think stannis is gonna go with this idea and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna all we're gonna go out there and maybe be about to execute Theon and then something miraculous will happen or the battle will start or something will happen and he won't actually be executed. That's seems like, again, Theon is too interesting of a character at this point to just execute and be rid of. And I also do like the idea that, um, that Theon could end up being like, like uh, the late comer King who wasn't at the king's mood, who will actually become king. So I do like that. Uh, how will he die? So I think he'll live. That is my answer. I think he will live. And I think that the, the idea it, the, that's being suggested is what's important. Asha says, go out there and strike his head off with your sorceress blade. So now we've got the idea of uh, Azor High with Lightbringer offering a sacrifice to a weirwood tree if we strip away the scene and just look at the symbols we have an azor high king stannis using lightbringer to sacrifice somebody in front of a weirwood tree and remember i said at the beginning of the stream that theon has all the symbolism of a knight's watchman or a last hero specifically one who's been killed and resurrected a green zombie knight's watchman you know of course the green zombie theory the story about the last hero is that he had 12 companions who all died when they were, you know, fighting the others. Uh, but then later, somehow the last hero emerges instead of the broken sword that he had before. Now he has dragon steel and he's leading the Night's Watch into battle, the War for the Dawn. I think what happened is that those 12 dead companions were raised from the dead. They became like cold hands. They became like Jon Snow is going to be undead Night's Watchmen. Undead Night's Watchmen is a thing. They're very important because undead people are the best to brave the cold of the lands of always winter. They don't need to eat or sleep. They don't need to be warm. We see that with cold hands. Cold hands can roam the north in perpetuity. He is not, he's good. He's totally good. Doesn't need to eat. He's fine. Um, so I think that's the story. That's what Theon is showing us. The symbolism of somebody who is broken, symbolically died, uh, the castration of Theon is also, we see that symbolism with the Night's Watchmen because they're not allowed to father any sons or take any wives when they go to the Night's Watch. So this, that's a symbolic castration or giving up of your fertility, a sacrifice of your fertility. So John, uh, Theon is already got that green zombie Night's Watch symbolism. Now it's being suggested that maybe Azor High should take Lightbringer and snick his head off in front of the Weirwood Tree. Um, so think of Ned, right? Ned always offers the blood that's on his sword to the weirwood tree by cleaning it off in the pond. And this, this is basically an echo of the older ritual that Bran sees where a victim has his throat cut in front of the weirwood tree in ancient times, the Winterfell weirwood tree, and the blood flows into the pool directly. Bran drinks and tastes the blood from inside of his weirwood cave thousands of years in the future. So we've got this running idea of we need to use a Lightbringer sword, a dragon sword to offer blood to the Weirwood Tree. Ed Stark cuts off the head of Garrod, the Night's Watchman, at the beginning. So again, we're executing a Night's Watchman. We're offering his blood to the Weirwood Tree. Um, and then here we have the idea that Stannis 
should execute Theon in front of the Weirwood Tree. Stannis has Lightbringer. Ned has the black dragon sword known as Ice. But of course, Ice gets melted down and reforged into Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale, which are dyed red and black, like my Damascus foam Oathkeeper here with the red and black blade. So Ned's Ice has become a symbolic light bringer, a symbolic red sword. Arya compares ice to the red comet, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, you can call it foam keeper if you want. Foam bringer, if you will. No innuendo there at all. Okay, so you see this idea. Light bringer, light bringer characters should offer victims to the weirwood tree, and this might be part of the green zombie resurrection ceremony, basically. That's, that's what's being implied here. Is that because Azor High, you know, I've said Azor High turned into the Knights King, and the last hero is kind of like Azor High. Basically, it's a hero archetype that George seems to like to take in two different ways. So the Knights King figure, or leader of the others figure, father of the others figure, that is the like the dark end of an Azor High figure. Um, the other end is to turn into a last hero, gain redemption win the war for the dawn. So we see these Azor high figures on both sides of the chessboard, both on the side of the others and the side of the living with the last hero figure. So what am I saying? I'm saying that uh, all this stuff about Azor high figures executing people in front of the weirwood trees, George is trying to show us the green zombie ritual. He's trying to show us how the original Night's Watchmen were made. They were ritually sacrificed, it seems, and then raised from the dead. Another scene that echoes this is um, Euron Redhand of the Ironborn. He calls a king's moot. And then he uh, 13 kings come, and he cuts the heads off all 13, and Naga's ribs run red with blood. Now, Naga's ribs are petrified weirwood. So what we have is Euron Redhand who is our evil Azor High figure. Think of Euron Crow's Eye, and think of how the Weirwood Leaves are described as red hands. So Euron Red Hand, evil Ironborn King, sacrifices 13 other kings. Think about, again, the last hero and 12 Night's Watchmen. That creates 13 characters. So he sacrifices 13 kings to, not to Naga's ribs, but it says that Naga's ribs drank the blood. They ran red with blood. So this is another symbolic weirwood blood offering by an Azor High figure. And again, the number 13, that's, that's our original crew of Night's Watchmen. So lots of cool echoes to that green zombie resurrection ceremony. When the Night's Watchmen give their oaths to the weirwood trees, it's another reenactment. John kneels as a boy and rises as a man. And he says his oaths to the Weirwoods. You know, I pledge my life to the Weirwoods, blah, 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 blah. I owe everything to the Weirwoods. I give my life to you, green seers in the Weirwoods. I will defend the realms of men and do everything you say, oh, Weirwood tree. <clears throat> oh, Weirwood tree, oh, Weirwood tree. So this is another reenactment of the green zombie ritual where we have green boys that kneel and then they're reborn as men, as black brothers. And of course, I pointed out in the Green Zombies video that the person, um, uh, the person who administers John's original Night's Watch oath is Bowen Marsh, who is also the person who then first stabs John, or not first, but um, last stabs John. So Bowen Marsh both kills John and administers John's Night's Watch oaths, different times in different places, but nevertheless, the symbolism is there to imply the, the uh, Night's Watchman oath to the Weirwood Tree ceremony as a death rebirth ceremony. All right, I think a super chat came through. Let me grab that. <clears throat> and yeah, you're getting some bird butt. Hey, LML, will John have to glamor himself to hide how his body's been changed when he's resurrected so not to confuse the men he leads to fight them? Um, so I think John will be so no i don't think john will need a glamour although that's not impossible or crazy i maybe melisandre hooks him up like john boy you're looking a little rough let's get you hooked up with one of these glamour stones they're really great they do wonders for your skin look at me 
Um, hang on a second. Goose says, is next to the camera. Hey, buddy. I can't have you there, Goosey. Let me put you over here. Um, but I think that John, John's zombiness will be unique. Uh, we're being, it's, it's hinted at that fire relore will obviously be involved. Melisandre will be involved. Um, but also Bran, I think will be involved. And we got this whole two-step process thing because John's spirit is inside his wolf ghost, right? So we need to raise his physical body and we need to port his spirit out of the wolf into his resurrected body. Then there's that dream where John is armored in black ice, wielding a sword that burns red. So it's almost like icy armored body, like a frozen hard body, but wielding a red sword. That would make sense if John has some ice and fire combination. And I've decoded that by saying that the others might steal his body. And so his corpse will rise with blue eyes and icy cold magic. But eventually fire magic or green seer magic or both will be used to drive that otherized intelligence out of John's body so that we can get John's spirit out of the wolf, put it back in John's resurrected body. <clears throat> if John's body was first raised by the others, it would be an icy body, a body armored in ice but his spirit would be hot and fiery inside. So that would give him the ice and fire combination. And Cold Hands, after all, has an icy frozen body, but is not controlled by the others. The only way that really happens is if Cold Hands originally was whited by the others, but was then fr somehow freed of the bondage. So it's spelled out and hinted at that that can happen. Okay, Goose, that's, that's really a lot. Thank you, buddy. So, <clears throat> so that's what's going to happen. John's, because of having different kinds of magic used to resurrect John, John will be a unique zombie. He won't be exactly like Cold Hands. He won't be exactly like Barrack. He's going to be something different. And I also think that Green Seers can raise the dead too. And I think that's the point of Leaf and Blood Raven telling Bran, oh, don't try to raise the dead. You, you totally can't do that. And don't try. It's very bad. It's kind of implying that actually, yes, it is possible, but that the consequences might be high. So I think Bran will be involved as well. And potentially a green seer resurrection. <clears throat> Maybe we can make a better zombie. I've, I've wondered, maybe we can make a zombie that is more like brought back to life with flowing blood and vital processes um, instead of just being an, a skin changed corpse, essentially, which is what uh, Cold Hands and Barrack are like. <clears throat> Barrack's obviously not a skin changer, but he's an animated corpse that's been repossessed by his own spirit or ghost, kind of. <clears throat> so I do hold a, a little bit of hope out for John being able to get boners with some sort of better green seer resurrection, but we'll have to see. I think it's going to be one of those RGB things like house Massey, red, green, and blue, you know, ice magic, fire magic, green seer magic. I think they will all be involved in resurrecting John. And of course, check out um, my Lord snow video and my Prince that was promised to the others video. I go deep on all of my John resurrection stuff there. Let me just check on my PayPal's real quick. Make sure I am up to date. Looks like I am, okay. So once again, final call for questions, folks, either through the paypal.me or it's right in the chat here. See some lively debate going on in the chat here. Hey, hey, don't bite the windscreen, girl. Do you think we'll get 
the POV of the fight inside the Weirwood Net? And will we meet Azor High, Knights King, Bloodstone Emperor, whoever this guy is? Yes. Um, I think we will see many things inside the Weirwood Net. And I've picked up on a lot of scenes which seem to be depicting a fight inside the Weirwood Net between a green seer person and some sort of otherized person. Uh, so I do think that that happened originally or is still going on. And I think we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll see that. I do think that um, either Bran will contact an entity inside the Weirwood Net that we'll think of as the Great Other or Night's King or something like that, or it could be that Euron is going to contact that entity with all his magical experimentation. And by the way, um, my Danny Glass candle video is almost done. I hope to finish that tonight, possibly, and put it out tomorrow morning or Tuesday morning if if I can't get it done by then. <clears throat> but uh, in the glass candle Danny video, I'm going to talk about Dana using the candle. But I also think that Euron has glass candles. I think that he's Eurothon, Nightwalker, and Karth. And I think Euron has been using the candles to know when to show up and when to attack and things like that. So I'm going to make a second glass candle video about Euron as well and talk about some of that. But Euron's definitely could be somebody contacting undead entities inside the astral plane or anything like that. Yeah. There's many jokes <laughs> in the new Valerian glass candle uh, videos. Many, many jokes. I can't talk about Marwin the mage without making a lot of jokes. It seems so. Yeah. That's the thing. That's right. It's coming. It's going to be good. It's going to be a zinger. Banger. Worth looking forward to. That's right. <clears throat> Eurothon Nightwalker. Yes, everyone's hero. Do you think Theon's eventual end will involve Bran? Maybe Theon's death at the site of a weirwood tree helps to fuel a magic ritual. Yes, obviously Bran and Theon are coming together here. Bran gave Theon his name back, and I think that's the whole point of the Ravens speaking up. Like the Ravens are trying to plant this idea of giving Theon to the tree even before Asha says it or comes into the room. They start clamoring for the tree and saying Theon and tree, right? So I think that that's either Blood Raven or Bran wanting Theon to be near the Weirwood tree so that something can happen. I do think that Theon is turning into an instrument of the old gods, which again parallels the idea of him as a Night's Watchman, as a last hero green zombie, who those were all instruments of the Green Seers as well, having been resurrected by Green Seers. <clears throat> I think Goose was yelling tree too. Yeah, he might have been. Raven seeing around corners. <laughs> Like good old Ken Kesey. So I don't think Bran wants Theon sacrificed uh, to finish the answer. Um, I mean, maybe, but I don't think so. I think that Theon is somebody who can hear the voice of the old gods because he's so broken. This is sort of an idea that like a lot of times <clears throat> the people that can hear the other realm are people like Patchface, Theon who've been sort of broken or half mad, half crazy. It's basically a shamanic belief that in order to walk in the spirit world, you kind of have to be half mad. And so Theon essentially is somebody that can hear Bran's voice. Um, so maybe, maybe Bran is going to be able to speak to him more in the future than to just say his name. And I think the idea is that they've got some sort of plan to use Theon so I don't think it'll just be his life. I think they want him to do something. And yeah, the chat is lively today. Thanks, everybody. Remember to leave a comment with your thoughts about Theon on the way out. Let me know what you think, what's going to happen, your best sarcastic one-liner, any of that stuff. And please don't name your child Irathon. 
They will not, they will not on behalf of them. Don't do that. Mm. So yeah, I do think Theon has a purpose. And I think that again, he's just, so, he's somebody that the old gods will be able to use that, that, uh, you know, he has a reverence for the old gods that other people don't. So yeah, I'm just, I'm not sure what it could be exactly, but it'll probably have something to do with retaking Winterfell, right? So Kobe Redhorse is asking, do I think George set out from the beginning to have such a complex storyline or did it evolve over time? Does he pick up ideas as he goes or is it already set in stone? Well, that's kind of both. He does have a pretty good idea of where it's going when he started out, but a lot of things have definitely evolved as he's gone. That's kind of how he how he, he keeps it interesting for him. He's talked about that. So, Do I have the hooded man in Winterfell? Um I like the idea that it is, uh, what's his name? It's that dude that appears with Wyman Manderley uh, when they when they appear when they talk to Davos, Robert Glover. He's basically like low key 007 of the North. If you sort of follow everything he does, so I like that Robert Glover is the is the uh, hooded man in Winterfell theory. I forget who did the write up on that. I read it years and years and years ago. All right, girl, come here. You're distracting me too much. Yeah, what's dead might never die. Of course, that is obviously a good description of a white. So that, that works here to imply Theon as undead as well. And that's kind of the point of cold hands. It's a cold hands is hard to kill. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you, Minty. So let's all, since we're talking about Winds of Winter, <clears throat> let's all take a moment to send a little positive intention to our friend, George R.R. R. Martin, who has spent his entire life writing stories for us, and occasionally directing TV shows. Let's all imagine George, George's fingers flowing on the typewriter. The idea is flowing in his brain, the pages of Winds of Winter being written. And hopefully Winds of Winter coming out soon, because we need it. We need it, George. We need it. So yes, take take a minute. Send George some positive energy. Help him finish it out. Imagine George rounding the last corners, solving the last puzzles, untangling the Winterfell knot, so to speak. <clears throat> Matthew, Matthew Kimmel asks Theon, future priest of the Weirwood. Yeah, he kind of he kind of is turning into that kind of figure, isn't he? Because of course the Grey King, and I'm looking at Goose to try to keep him quiet. The Grey King is the Ironborn folk hero, but he's actually full of green seer symbolism. And we see Theon with all this Weirwood symbolism, the bloody hands and stuff, the splintered mouth almost like tree teeth, like wooden teeth. That's to be cool. Theon should get some wooden teeth. Wouldn't that be good? Basically, the idea is that, yeah, Theon is, is a kind of priest, and all of the Ironborn priest ideas are actually weirwood priest ideas. That's why the original priest of the Ironborn, Galen Whitestaff, Galen Garth Whitestaff, he carried a weirwood staff. So that kind of just shows you like all the ironborn symbolism is really talking about weird stuff. So I totally think that uh, Theon is, his role is archetypal role is that of a weird priest. Yeah, that makes sense. Theon tree teeth. King Theon tree teeth. Yeah, that's good. Let it, let make it so. Hello, Helen O'Grady. We got a strong Australian contingent here today. This is great. Yeah, Treon instead of Theon. And of course, um, the name Theon, of course, Theos is the Greek word, which means God or divine. And a Theon is the objective form of uh, 
of that word. So a theon is a godly object or divine object. So basically, it's already been spelled out that theon is a tool of the gods. He's not a god. He's a tool of the gods. He's an object of the gods. And so now we see theon becoming that, literally an object and a device of the old gods. So no, he's not Gollum. He's he's a little, he's going to aim higher than Gollum. I mean, he's physically, he's a little Gollum. Yeah, I, I'll give you that. Gollum, Gollum. Yeah, Baratheon. So I talked about this in the Vedic Danny video, actually. <clears throat> um, yeah, so the Baratheons, they also are uh, have that implication of a divine object. In, in the Baratheon's case, the divine object is the hammer. It's the hammer of the gods or the lightning of the gods. Think of Zeus or Thor with their divine lightning bolts and hammers. So... Yeah, that's what the Baratheon is about. And Bera means, I forget what Bera means, but it, it contributes to that too. Check out Vedic Origins of Danny and Drogon, and I'll give you the whole breakdown on that. So, okay, yeah, that, that actually is a good parallel. Gollum is an essential part of the destruction of the ring. And Bran, what Bran is going to be doing is much like Frodo, he's trying to shut down a power that's been abused. <clears throat> I don't think humans are supposed to be in the weirwood net. I don't think humans are supposed to be using the green seer magic. Like I've said, that's the whole point about Azor High being an invader in the weirwood net. Bran is going to help close that down. It's going to take the human green seer hive mind and take it on into his Bran brain so that it can get out of the weirwood trees. I've said that many times. So if Theon were to help Bran in some way or become Bran's assistant or something, maybe he'll he'll push Bran's weir, well, you know, his weirwood wheelchair. <clears throat> then that would be similar to a Frodo and Gollum relationship in a way because Frodo act, or Gollum actually helps Frodo destroy the ring. He in fact does destroy the ring. So yeah, I could see that parallel working. It's good good uh good call, real Rick. Nice one. Got him. Got him. All right, guys. So uh, it's, we're just about two hours in. I will take last, last, last call for questions. And then I will go ahead and wrap it up. And I'm going to go work on my Danny video and try to finish it up. My glass candle video. Ah, super chat. Thanks. Thanks. I missed one. <clears throat> I think Theon was actually understanding the true tongue when he heard Bran say his name in the godswood, the rustling of the leaves and all that. Yes. Thank you, Tommy, for bringing this up. Um, I do think that's what happens, is that really all that's happening is the, the leaves are rustling and the wind is blowing. That's the speech of the old gods. But Theon is able to understand it. There is definitely a magical implication there. Like other people would be sitting there and they wouldn't hear it. But Theon does. So I, I do think that is being implied. Good call, Tommy. Good comments today, guys. Appreciate that. Might we see the sea stone chair again? I certainly hope so. Big oily black stone meteor chair that it is. I'll push your weirwood wheelchair once I'm done inspecting the God tool. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. Glad you guys are having fun in the chat. <clears throat> so Theon speaks druidic. Yes, kind of, yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying. I think that is what I'm saying. Well, thank you, mods. You guys are great. And thank you, chat. You guys are awesome. Here's the link for that Vedic origins of Danny. <clears throat> I will also request, once again, if you haven't watched my Odin Origins brand video, it's got criminally low views. It's a great video. I do say so myself. So 
if you want to learn a little bit about Norse mythology, you don't know that much about it, Goose, please, then check out those Odin Origins videos. It's a great way to get into some of the Odin mythology and see how it impacts A Song of Ice and Fire. So check that out. But that's it, guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Have a great Sunday. And I will see you with a new video, hopefully tomorrow, maybe the day after that.